Well, good morning. Welcome. So glad to have you here with us this morning. As we begin a time of worship today, uh, I want to turn our attention to Psalm 63, verses 1 through 5. David writes, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods, with singing lips, my mouth will praise you. This morning, as we find our satisfaction in God and in him alone, we lift up our voices together to sing praises to him. So go ahead and stand and join us as we sing praises to our God.
Let's continue our worship this morning. We're going to be we're going to be reading from Psalm two. So if you would join me uh, when you're prompted by the screen. If you're reading from your insert, please join me in the bold. Psalm two. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, "Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles." The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, 
I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son or he will be angry and your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him.
lips to praise you no matter the circumstance and the good and the bad and remind us every day that you are the King of Kings. Amen. Amen. As God has greeted us, we'd like to greet each other. So please go ahead, find somebody you might not know, give them a hi and a hello and greet each other right now. And children, you may go to Children's Church. Okay, okay, I see you're all having a lot of fun. Let's go ahead and let's, uh, let's come back to our, back to our seats. We're going we're gonna to continue our worship here this morning. We're going we're gonna to stand together, actually, for this song. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna sing before the throne of God. And uh, let's, uh, let's sing it together joyfully uh, to prepare our hearts for, uh, for the message this morning. Oh 
the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me then steep on. No tongue can bid me then steep on. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on Him and pardon me. To look on Him and pardon me. Hallelujah. This morning, we've reached the end of a journey that some of us have been looking forward to for quite some time. Uh, this morning, we are finishing Deuteronomy. Uh, we've, we've been calling it the Gospel According to Moses, and as we finish our study of this book, we also finish with the end of the life and ministry of Moses. That's how the book ends and that's how our time in it will come to an end. Um, I, I started studying this a couple weeks ago because I was not sure how to, how to deal with the fact that Moses' death is described in two different spots. Um, and it was, it was really hard. It was not because uh, there's anything difficult about the passage, but it's emotional. It's, um, there, there's, there's bittersweetness here. There's sadness here. There's joy, but it's, 
the end for Moses is, is not what he would have hoped that it would be. And if we recall, he mentioned that a few times early in the book. He mentioned to the Israelites, hey, I don't get to go in with you and I blame you for that. <laughs> he was not thrilled <laughs> that he would not get to go into the promised land. Uh, but he does get to see it. So there is some sweetness to it. Um, I, I, I know it might sound weird, but I was mourning the death of Moses over the last few weeks. Because I've gotten to know him better than I have at any other time in my life. Um, and even though he's been dead for a few thousand years, um, I, I walked through that journey of a new and afresh. And, and it's, it is sad. Um, and so as we'll, we, we're going to see some things that are helpful for us in this text, um, it has that undercurrent of we, we are, as we close out the book, we're also closing out the life of an incredible man of God who uh, fell short of the mark that God had set for him and for all of us. And, and we have hope in Christ as Moses also had hope in the God who he knew face to face. Who, though he did not get to go in the promised land, he still had a very, very special end to his life. So we're going to be looking at the end of an era. It's uh, split between two passages, as I mentioned. So we're going to look at Deuteronomy 32, verse 48 through 52, and then flip over to chapter 34 and read all of that chapter as well. So if you can keep up with my page flips, we'll be good. And if you can't, that's okay. Just sit back and listen and soak it in as we finish out the book of Deuteronomy. It says, On that same day the Lord told Moses, Go up into the Abarim range to Mount Nebo in Moab, across from Jericho, and view Canaan, the land I am giving the Israelites as their own possession. There on the mountain that you have climbed, you will die. And be gathered to your people. Just as your brother Aaron died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people. This is because both of you broke faith with me in the presence of the Israelites. At the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the desert of Zin. And because you did not uphold my holiness among the Israelites. Therefore you will see the land only from a distance. You will not enter the land I am giving to the people of Israel. Now before you turn, I misspoke. We're not starting with verse 48. We're starting with verse 44. Uh, 45, 45. These paragra paragraph breaks are driving me crazy. Because uh, they're not where I would put them. And I keep looking down and going, where, where, where am I supposed to be? Verse 45 because we didn't finish that out. When we looked at the song, I felt like the, the song was long enough. So I didn't add what Moses said after the song. So when Moses finished reciting all the words, all these words to all Israel, and there's question, is it all the words of the song or the whole book of Deuteronomy? And I'm taking it as the whole book of Deuteronomy. So that's why we're looking at it this week. When Moses finished reciting all these words to all Israel, he said to them, Take to heart all the words I have solemnly declared to you this day so that you may command your children to obey carefully all the words of this law. They are not just idle words for you. They are your life. By them you will live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So there's his final words to the people. Okay, now, ver now chapter 34. <clears throat> then Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah, across from Jericho. There 
the Lord showed him the whole land from Gilead to Dan. All of Naphtali, the territory of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the Mediterranean Sea, the Negev and the whole region from the valley of Jericho, the city of Palms, as far as Zoar. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. He buried him in Moab, in the valley opposite Beth Peor, but to this day no one knows where his grave is. Moses was a hundred and twenty years old when he died. Yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. The Israelites grieved for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days, until the time of weeping and mourning was over. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom, because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all those signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to his whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you often for your word, and we thank you again, especially as we're reminded by Moses about how powerful it is about how life-giving it is and how it reminds us of how incredible you are. Lord, as we finish our, our journey, our look at, at the life and teaching of Moses this morning, I pray that you would impress upon our hearts the things that you would have for us to learn, to remember, to rejoice in, to be sorrowful in, that you would help us to examine our own lives and, and how we too have fallen short as Moses did and how we too have received grace in the midst of that brokenness. Lord, I pray that as, as we look to your word this morning, that it would speak to us in new and fresh ways, that we would be molded and shaped and transformed by it as we often are, and we thank you for that. We pray that your word would once again be powerfully at work among us today. I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, turn backwards again to the end of chapter 32. We're going to begin with that, that portion that I skipped and then came back to. And, and these, these words of Moses about the word of God. We're going to be looking at the concept of a powerful word. So the end of an era, the end of Moses, the end of this journey that God's people had through the wilderness as they now are about to enter into the promised land. And, and that's been the backdrop of the whole study of the book of Deuteronomy. Remember that as it began, they were already on the cusp. They haven't moved in this whole book. It's all taking place right there on the border of the promised land. And, and they're now going to get to go in under the leadership not of Moses, but of Joshua. So Moses, as he finishes out speaking to them, 
points them to this final thing, this overarching principle, the thing that drives all of the words that Moses have spoken. And that is that by teaching these things to your children, by obeying them, you will have life. You'll live long in this land that you're about to possess. It reminded me of how the book began. Remember that in, in English, we call it Deuteronomy, which is not really an English word. It comes from the Greek title that means second law. But, but in Hebrew, the title came from the opening of the book, which is, these are the words. These are the words Moses spoke to all Israel in the wilderness east of the Jordan. These are the words. This, this whole book, this whole thing that we've looked at and, and struggled our way through. These are the words that bring life. They're not just idle words for God's people. They are life. This is, this is a concept that extends far beyond the book of Deuteronomy for us, but certainly includes it. That God's word is what brings us life. We live by it. We have life because of it, in it, through it. That, that God's word is what guides us and directs us and gives us everything that we need every day for life in him. These words are not just idle words for you, for me. They are our life. This, this is how we live, is by dwelling on these words, by meditating on them, by studying them, by, by being changed by them, by being directed in how we think and how we act and how we feel, how we treat others, how we use our time, how we live life. These are the words of life. The word is our life. So we live by it. We receive life from it. And we know because of other parts of the word, of these words... That the Son of God himself is the Word. That he became, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? That, that Christ dwells in his words. The Word is living and active. That it cuts to the heart, separating joint and marrow. That, that God's Word changes everything about us. And, and so we don't just cast it aside. We don't, we don't treat it idly. We don't treat it as just another book. But we, we value it. We, we give time to it regularly. Because we know that this is where we find life. It's powerful. It continues to speak to us. That people who have spent their whole lives studying it over and over and over again continue to find things that God has to say to them today that they didn't see before. Not because it wasn't there or because they've made something new up, but because it continues to convict us in new ways as we continue to be changed by it. That, that as, as we continue on our own journeys through our own wildernesses to our own promised joys, that God continues to teach us new things. But it's the, the new things often are also the old things. They're the same things that He's taught us before, but in a new way and in a slightly different way 
than, than we learned it before, than we understood it before, than we appreciated it before. Because it's, it's alive as we are alive. And as, as we are changed, as we grow in him, we see things that we didn't have the maturity to see before. Before we saw the, the ba- this, this part and now our eyes have been opened and we can see deeper, broader. We can understand even better the power of God's word. And so we continue to come back to it over and over and over again. Uh, that's the powerful word. We're going to move from there, though, to the, the, the kind of focus of our passages this morning. That's first, a bittersweet gift. God brings Moses right to the edge of the promised land. He gets to see it, but he doesn't get to enter it. God reminds Moses why he doesn't get to the enter. He, he says it's because you and Aaron broke faith with me in the presence of the Israelites at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the desert of Sin, and because you did not uphold my holiness among the Israelites. God, in his grace, points out both Moses, he he points out Moses' deficiencies, but then in his grace, he also gives Moses a gift that he did not give to the others of his generation who also broke faith with God in that same place. So those who made the decision not to enter the land because of the report from the spies... That generation dies out. They wander the desert for a whole generation so that those people won't get to enter the land. Moses survives that journey. But because of his own unfaithfulness also doesn't get to enter the land. But he gets to see it. He gets a gift that the others did not receive. He gets to go up to a special place, all alone, and take in the view. This is what God is giving to his people. This is, for Moses, what he gets to see of the fulfillment of God's promises to his people. God, in his grace, points out these deficiencies, doesn't eliminate the consequences, but but severely lessens them for Moses. You might say, death doesn't seem like a lessening of consequences. I understand. It's a pretty dramatic thing. But think about that. He doesn't just die wandering in the desert. He gets to see the land. He gets a a burial by God himself. I don't know of many other people who get that. It's a special thing. And we know from other parts of scripture that that this death is not the end for Moses. That he lives on. That he is resurrected as as those who place their faith in God are. That, That he appears again on a mountain of all places with Elijah and Jesus at the transfiguration. That he appears again at the end of all things. That there's this continuation of Moses' life that that we get glimpses into at these key special moments. God shows us, look, Moses is still, he's still with God. The, The man who saw God face to face continues in his presence. He just doesn't get to experience Life in the land. That's all. He lives to 120 years old. His eyes don't fade. His strength remains. I I don't know 
anyone who has lived that long. I don't know if any of us know anyone who has lived that long. But I'm pretty sure that all of us, when we think about the people who have lived the longest, would say their strength faded as they got older. Because that's the way it works. But that's not the way it worked with Moses. So there are consequences, but they're lessened. They're different than the consequences for the others who broke faith in the desert. Moses' sin included elevating himself in front of the people. That's, that's what God points out to him here. In, in Numbers 20, we get the story. We get the instructions. Where God tells him to speak over a rock so that water will come out. And instead Moses hits the rock. Paul tells us that the rock was Jesus. So if you were wondering if, why it hurt the rock. I mean it doesn't hurt Jesus. But there's a concept there of, of striking the presence of God. The, 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 the iteration of God's presence that's there. It includes anger. He, he strikes the rock in frustration. It happens right after they decide not to go into the land because they're afraid. And so Moses is frustrated with the people as now they, they refuse to do what God wants them to do and they grumble and complain about lack of water. Moses is frustrated and so in anger he strikes the rock. He, he disobeys the specific instructions God gave him and he does that because of his anger. And beyond that, he, he's not trusting God to do something bigger than before. So for those who, I, I get confused sometimes when, when Bible stories are similar but slightly different. There's another place where God provides water from a rock. In the lifetime of Moses. And that happens in Exodus 16. And there, God does tell Moses to strike that rock. This time, God tells Moses, don't strike it, speak over it. It seems like that's a bigger mirror. I mean, I don't, I guess striking a rock could break it open and if there's a spring behind it, it can release that water. I guess, I've never had that experience. I've never seen water come out of a rock like that before. But, but what God is asking Moses to do is trust him for something greater. He's not even going to, he's not supposed to touch the rock. Just speak and watch God work. And instead of trusting God to work, Moses tries to take matters into his own hands. Quite literally. That is the biggest connection point and parallel to what the people that Moses is frustrated with did themselves, right? They, they hear the report from the scouts that say, there's some really big people in the land. We don't, we've seen God do amazing things. He, he parted the sea and drowned the, the people who were chasing us. He rained down all these plagues. But we don't think he can defeat those people because they're too big. And Moses goes, well, clearly there's something wrong here. Because God's not getting through to these people. I need to get through to them. And he takes matters into his own hands. He doesn't trust God to work in his way, in his time. Moses gets a similar punishment. He doesn't get to enter the land. They also are forbidden from entering the land. They also face death, but it's not an instant one. So there's other times where God punishes his people quickly. But for this, he stretches it out. He says, you're going to live out your life. You just won't live it out in this place. That's true for those who refuse to enter and it's true for Moses. It's true for Aaron. But he gets this gift of seeing the land. 
that the others did not receive. Aaron didn't get that gift. Moses gets a special gift. He gets to see it before he dies. He gets so close. And so it's bittersweet. God reminds him in this final conversation. Here's my faithfulness. This is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When I said I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes. But you will not cross over into it. God in his grace shows us our deficiencies. Lessens the punishment but doesn't completely remove all the consequences. God in his grace forgives us of our sin through the blood of his son. We don't have to die eternally because he did. He died for us. We still face the consequences of sin in this life. They're just not as great as they would be without Christ. They're lessened because of his grace. We're reminded of our sin even as we're forgiven for it. Of it. God's grace sometimes involves a bittersweet gift where we do receive the forgiveness that we long for. We do receive the the special relationship with God that Moses continued to enjoy even after striking the rock. He continued to go into God's presence and interact with him face to face. That's an amazing gift that nobody else received. We continue to have an experience, relationship, direct access to the throne of grace. Even as we live out the consequences of sin generally. And sometimes specifically in the world. But we still have that hope of eternal life. Of being resurrected anew. Of experiencing life in God's presence as we see Moses continued to. Even though he dies there on that mountain. Even though he's buried there and nobody knows where. We know that he continued in God's presence. And we have that hope ourselves. That whatever the temporal, temporary consequences might be of our specific sins and of just the general brokenness and sinfulness of the world as a whole, we have that hope of eternal life in his presence. And we, we have the first fruits, the, the, the beginnings of those promises, even now as we experience that life with him today. And so the the consequences might be lessened, but the hope has already begun to bear fruit in our lives. So it's bittersweet. It's a bittersweet gift of grace. And we end with what I, I call it a defining success. The end of this era involves a powerful word, a bittersweet gift, and a defining success. The narrator who tells us how Moses' life ends gives us also his perspective on who Moses is. We don't know who wrote this part. It certainly wasn't Moses. How would that have worked? God doesn't tell us who this person is. Moses, the, the author doesn't claim to be Moses himself. So there's no concern there for anybody who thought, but I thought Moses wrote all the words. Clear, not this part, and, and there's no claim to that. Somebody wrote this part for us. We don't know when. So there's some different things that, 
that come into play. There's, there's discussion of regions where God's people lived that were not set up at the time that Moses died. So it probably was later. Or updated, perhaps. That's okay. The, there's a lot that we worry about when it comes to um, knowing exactly when and how God's word was written. So when we talk about the Gospels, that's a concern that we have. To say it was written by people who knew him, who saw him, were eyewitnesses at a specific time. So we go to great lengths to defend when something was written. This is not one of those passages that we worry over exactly when it was written. It's not that important or consequential. Because it's still clearly the inspired word of God. It's clearly true. It's clearly accurate to what happened and what's important to know about what happened. And, and what this person tells us, whoever they were, is that as, as much as Moses didn't live up completely to God's standard for him, there's nobody quite like Moses. So, so there's some questions about why it seems like what we read at the end of 32 and then we begin ver chapter 34, it seems like that's a, that would just flow seamlessly together. So why was there this blessing from Moses in the middle? It doesn't seem like it fits there. And, and he probably realized that this condemnation from God at the end of what we call chapter 32 doesn't flow well into the positive things that he wrote about Moses later at the end of 34. So the blessings sort of become a bridge. Again, I, I think that they, they were said by Moses on the day that he was going to go up the mountain. I just don't think that the narrator has to put these things together somehow. And I think he put them together in that way to, to give you a chance to breathe between when God tells Moses why he's going to die and then, then this final ending. That, that, and, and maybe that's not quite accurate, but there, again, there's, all of this is narrative inserts. The words of Moses are not there in the end of 32. They're the words of a narrator, as is also the case with 34. So somebody compiled the words of Moses, put them together in this format for us, and that's okay. We don't need to worry about that. That's not a concerning thing. That's a, actually, when I look at those kinds of things, I get excited about how God worked beyond just Moses, but to other people who followed him faithfully and, and saw this word as worthy of being retained and compiled together, put together in this way so that God's people would have it for future generations. I think that's incredible. I would say that the person who put this together and wrote this, the narration parts probably took to heart all the words that Moses solemnly declared to God's people on that day and said, yeah, these are not just idle words. Let's find a way to keep them. Let's find a way to pass them on from generation to generation. And one way to do that involves explaining what happened to Moses. We know from from how God continued to, to work in and through Joshua, that he continued to speak to his people. So we don't know when, we don't know how, but we know that God communicated to his people what happened to Moses on that mountain. And then somebody thought, we should write that down, so that other people know what happened to Moses on that mountain. As they reflect on the life of Moses, whenever it was that they did this, 
they say, wow, he was pretty incredible. His spirit passes on to Joshua so that Joshua can continue to lead the people. One of the ways that they know that they as a sign of that is that when they go to cross the Jordan River, God parts the river so that they can cross on dry land. It's a sign that this is now the person that God has chosen to lead his people as Moses did. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. How amazing is that? It says, since then no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. No other prophet could say that. No other prophet could say that they did all the signs and wonders like Moses did in Egypt before Pharaoh and his whole land. That there are pieces of what, what Moses did that Joshua gets to do, like the crossing of the sea. But Joshua doesn't get to oversee ten plagues. Joshua doesn't get to see the fiery mountain the same way Moses did. He was there, but he doesn't, he doesn't have the same perspective. He doesn't have the same connection that Moses did. There's a difference. And so subsequent prophets get, get messages from God. I, Isaiah gets to see a glimpse of God's heavenly throne room. But Isaiah doesn't get to do the incredible mighty deeds that Moses does. There's bits and pieces along the way of similarities. Moses becomes a template. He defines what it means to be God's messenger to his people. So that other messengers of God have a standard to follow, to live up to. Jeremiah, when, when God calls him, says... Uh, I, I think you mean somebody else. If you read Jeremiah 1, it sounds an awful li lot like how Moses responded to the burning bush. Uh, I'm not good at this. I'm, I'm, I'm young. Pick somebody else. Send somebody else. There's a tradition among God's prophets of saying, um, not me. Isaiah says, pick me. And then he finds out what God sends him to do and, and, and is not as excited as he was. <laughs> Moses is the prophet among prophets. He's, he's the one that other leaders of God's people are measured against. I'd say that's a defining success. He doesn't get to go in the land. Okay, he gets to see it. He gets to do so many things that nobody else does. As an aside, just because I'm always looking for opportunities to talk about this, um, most of us, when we talk about prophecy, are thinking about predictions of the future. And Moses does a bit of that, as we've seen in our journey through Deuteronomy. But most of what he does is not that. Most of what he does is give instruction. He delivers God's word to God's people. And if we dig into the other prophets, what we find is a similar blend. That yes, there is some prediction of the future from time to time. But mostly what they do is deliver God's message to his people. And more often than not, God's message is instructions. Stop worshiping idols. Don't do that anymore. Come back to following me. I've been faithful to you. Be faithful to me. That's the message of the prophets over and over and over again. Somebody calls the, likes to there's a few people now, they, it, it's caught on. But they, they like to refer to the prophets as covenant prosecutors. Because Deuteronomy lays out the terms 
of God's covenant with his people. It says, this is what I'm going to do. This is what you're called to do. The prophets come and they often point to Deuteronomy. And say, look, this is what God says you're supposed to do and not do. And look at what you're doing and not doing. It doesn't match up. That they become the prosecutors of God's people in the court of God's law. That they stand and say, you're not holding up your end of the deal. That is what a prophet does. That is what Moses did. Over and over again. He goes back to the people and says, um, this golden cow, where did it come from? That's not part of the deal. Crush it up. Put it in some water and drink the powder. To remind you of the bitterness of your sin. That's prophecy. Anyway, that, that is a, an aside. But it fits with, this is what it means to be a successful prophet of God. Is to faithfully deliver the message that God has for his people to his people. Sometimes that message is, here's what God's going to do. Here's what God has done. Here's God's promises fulfilled. Sometimes it's, here's what you're supposed to do. Here's your end of the deal. Sometimes it's, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. And every now and then it's, here's what the future looks like. Sometimes that's a bright future and sometimes it's not a bright future depending on whether or not God's people are following God. Moses becomes the standard. He is the defining success of what it looks like to be a prophet of God. To proclaim faithfully to God's people God's message. God's good news, that he loves his people, that he has always loved his people, that he does incredible mighty acts to deliver his people, and that all he asks in return is that his people will love him faithfully, will show their allegiance to him alone, will live as his people among each other and among the nations. That's the message of Deuteronomy. And it turns out that's the message of Scripture. The whole Bible. That God loves his people. That he pours out blessings on his people. And just asks of us that we faithfully show our allegiance to him. And him alone. As, as we close out our time in Deuteronomy, I have to admit, we're not quite done. <laughs> I'm sorry. But I'm not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. This is my last message on Deuteronomy. And don't worry if you're looking for that loophole. Pastor Ben's not preaching on Deuteronomy next week either. Next week, our kids are doing a program during the sermon time. So we'll still do all our normal singing and scripture reading and all that. But then during this part of the service, our kids are going to put on a program for us. They, in Children's Church, have been studying the book of Exodus, the life of Moses, alongside our journey through Deuteronomy. And as they finished that, they've been looking at how Moses points us to Jesus. And, and Lauren came to me and said, I've been thinking about what if we put together a program where the kids talk about here's how Moses prepares us for Jesus. And I said, well, you know, as I finish, we're right on that cusp of Advent, of looking at the birth of Jesus. So why not? So it's not a Christmas program per se, but there will be some Christmas songs. It's not a Moses program per se, but there will be some Moses parts. They're going to be bridging the gap for us between Moses and Jesus.
And I just think that's incredible. So we're kind of done with Moses, but we're also kind of not done with Moses. Uh, so that's something to look forward to next week. Uh, as we've concluded this journey in Deuteronomy, it's the end of an era. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for Moses. We thank you for his successes and his failures and how they, even in his failures, remind us of your grace. That, that as we fail to live up to the standards that we know you've set, that we know we can't live up to, we're reminded of your grace, your mercy, your loving kindness that never fails. Lord, we pray that you would help us as we, too, aim to be those who live faithful lives, who show our allegiance to you and to you alone. Lord, give us the, all that we need to do all that you've asked us to, to be faithful to you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So I'd like to uh, in, invite you to sit quietly in your pews and, and, and reflect on, on uh, the, the message spoken here this morning. If you, if you feel led to, to stand and sing, please do so. But uh, after the song, we will all stand together and uh, proclaim the greatness of our God together.
stand together. We're going to sing how great is our God to conclude our service today. Bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.